All right, so this is the third and final video covering the peripheral nerve lesions table on the last page of the hand section in your book. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the median claw and the OK gesture. And so we're, again, just like the other videos, we're going to go through each individually, and then at the end, we're going to make a comparison, make sure you can distinguish both of them. So now we've, caught, we've covered the proximal median nerve injury. Let's go into the last pair here where we talk about a distal median nerve injury and then a proximal ulnar nerve injury. So first, a distal median nerve injury. So again, we'll review here. That's going to be more at this point here. Here's your median nerve. It's going to be somewhere here at the wrist like this. As you can see, median nerve comes in here. This is going to be, so it's going to be strictly affecting the hand muscles because as you can see, the median nerve has already begun up here. It's already given off innervation to all the forearm flexor muscles. So down here, we're talking about affecting the hand. And then as you can see here, the median nerve as it comes into the hand, you know, it's giving off innervation through this recurrent branch to the thenar eminence, and then it's giving off innervation to the lumbricals, and so on. So the muscle deficits with distal median nerve injury is going to essentially be the first and second lumbricals like we've talked about. So these guys right here, these ones are going to be okay because these are ulnar nerve, th third and fourth, and then the thenar eminence. So these muscles here that help flex the thumb and oppose the thumb, those are going to be affected. So what are you going to see on physical exam as a result of that? Now, again, you should probably have this down by now because we've repeated it so many times by this point. But again, it's knowing the function of the lumbricals is so important because it really can help you identify these lesions and help differentiate them. So first and second lumbricals, and this especially comes into play as well for brachial plexus lesions, which we'll go over in the next video when we go through some cases of brachial plexus. Under, understanding how the lumbricals are affected and their innervation and their action is can really help you differentiate different brachial plexus lesions as well so again loss of second and third digit mcp flexion so that's these guys right here so you can see where it's the they're extended here in this resting position and then you have loss of second and third digit pip and dip extension so you can see where these guys kind of curl up like this so they're flexed so here's your pips and then your dip right here so that's where you see that and the other thing I want to point out here again is that the lumbricals are the main extenders of the PIP and DIP joint. The extensor compartment muscles of the forearm that are innervated by the radial nerve, they are not they have very little contribution to extension of PIP and DIP. They are the main extenders of the MCP joint, but those muscles don't really do much to extend the PIP and DIP joint. That almost exclusively rests on the lumbricals and then again like we've said some assistance from the inner assistance from the inner osseous muscle so really by losing these lumbricals you've lost the major extensor force at these PIP and DIP joints and then the flexor muscles in the forearm act unopposed you can have some ape hand here and you can kind of see this thumb hanging out here where it's not really able to oppose or flex too well because you have that, you know, you have the median nerve that comes in here like this, and then it gives off that recurrent branch, which innervates these parts right here. So that's what gives you this presentation along with the median claw. So what's normal is the fourth and fifth digit MCT, MCP flexion, because that's ulnar nerve. Digits one through five MCP extension, because that's radial nerve, so that's intact. Fourth and fifth digit PIP and DIP extension, those are going to be the lumbricals as well. That's going to be ulnar nerve, so ulnar nerve is intact. And then digits two through five PIP and DIP flexion. And now these are going to be intact because these are proximal to the injury. Okay? So even though the muscles that do these are forearm flexors, And even though they're innervated by median nerve, the, the median nerve innervation to these muscles is proximal to the injury. So the muscles, by the time they've reached the injury point here in the distal portion, these muscles have already received their innervation. So it doesn't matter that the median nerve, it can, could be completely cut here. It still doesn't matter. So where you're going to see these presentation is in the hand. So now you have what's called the median claw. And this is when extending the fingers or at rest. So first extending. So it's, the, it's really the opposite of the ulnar claw. So in the ulnar claw, these two fingers get stuck because the lumbricals are out. It's the reverse here. So these two, the f digits two and three get stuck. So you, you're trying to extend all fingers out, all four fingers out, and you can perfectly f do that with your fourth and fifth digit here. But since you have these deficits with the lumbricals, you can't do that here. You can't extend these fingers out, and so they get stuck and they form this deformity here. The other thing is when you lay the hand at rest, again, you're essentially just kind of letting your fingers re relax 
they're just going to extend out like this. So these extend out. These aren't able to relax because there's no ex there's no counterbalance here. It's all it's the flexion forces of these PIP and DIP joints that are acting unopposed. So the sensory loss in this patient, it's a median nerve injury. It's going to be median nerve distribution. So it's going to be in this uh, red section here on the palmar aspect, so the first three and a half fingers here, and then also the tips of the fingers on the dorsal aspect. So a proximal ulnar injury. Now again, the big difference here is we is we want to so, sh is show that it's not here at the wrist. So it's not there. It's it, the lesion is happening more proximal where it's affecting forearm innervation. Same here thing here. Here's where the ulnar nerve. This is a good view of the ulnar nerve traveling through the more medial aspect of the forearm. So it's really affecting it up here, not so much down here at the wrist. So what are the muscle deficits going to be that are going to occur? Ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus. So if we show that right here again, if we split it in half here, here's the medial half here. This is ulnar nerve. Here's the lateral half here. This is median nerve. So what you've lost since it's an ulnar nerve injury is you're going to lose the medial or ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus, which is going to affect digits four and five here. So one, so two and three here are going to be okay. Then as a result of also affecting ulnar nerve, you're going to lose the fourth and fifth lumbricals. So these guys right here. And then you're going to lose your dorsal inner osseae and your palmar inner osseae, which are also ulnar nerve. So you've lost these three set again. So the physical exam deficits that are going to occur here is that the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus you're going to be losing fourth and fifth digit DIP flexion. So these joints right here you can see where they're extended out like this. There's no force to help pull them back in. The extender forces are acting unopposed so there's no balance so that, they're, that those joints will be extended. Again the fourth and fifth lumbricals so you've lost MCP flexion here. So you see that these are extended out like this and then loss of fourth and fifth digit PIP and DIP extension. So essentially these fingers are, in a way, at these joints going to be just kind of pointing straight out. You have weaker extension at these joints. So moving on to the dorsal inner osseae and the palmar inner osseae. So these are paired together. So they both do extension at the PIP and DIP joints, uh, digits two through five, so they don't act on the thumb. And one thing to note here is we say two through five, is that the inner osseae are not like the lumbricals. They're all innervated by the same nerve, that ulnar nerve. So if you knock out ulnar nerve, you're going to lose the inner osseae function on all four of the fingers. And again, just to remind you here, is that, because we really want to drive this point home, is that the main extender of the PIP and the DIP joints is the lumbricals and then with help from the dorsal and palmar inner osseae. The extensor compartment of the forearm does not contribute much to extension at these joints. So again, that's why in this presentation, again, you're going to see where you've lost extension at the PIP and the DIP joints as well. Now, what's going to be normal here is that you're going to have MCP flexion at digits one through three. So your thumb and then your index finger and your middle finger because those are median nerve, okay? And median nerve's intact. Then you have digits one through five MCP extension. So those are due to radial nerve, which are the extensor compartment of the forearms. So they do extension at the MCP joint, but very little extension at the PIP or DIP joint. And then digits two through five PIP flexion, that's flexor digitorum superficialis, which is median nerve. So those are intact. So what that gives you is that you have the signature sign which is the okay gesture when making a fist. So when someone tries to make a fist, they actually end up making kind of this okay sign like this because you've lost flexion at the MCP joints of digits four and five because of the lumbricals. And then you've also lost extension at the PIP and DIP joints of digits four and five as well because of the lumbricals. And so then they kind of stick out like this. And then the other thing is, is that these you've also lost flexion. So these kind of stick out neutrally like we talked about because you've lost flexion at the DIP joint as well. You've lost extension and flexion because you've lost the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus. So really these fingers are just kind of, they're, again, they get stuck. So when someone tries to make a fist or, or make it an okay sign or bring all four fingers up to the thumb, they can bring the first two fingers, digits two and three, but digits four and five get left behind because they're stuck because they have these ulnar nerve deficit. 
And again, just to remind you, ulnar nerve injuries, if they're prolonged, they can have atrophy of the hyperthenar eminence, which is this region in here. We have these two pictures here to show you what it would normally look like. So here's, you know, you're making an OK sign. That's from one view here. If you were to turn your finger and do, or turn your hand and show the same thing here, as, you're, as you can see, you can, you can pull all four fingers up this way. These two fingers here, and then these medial fingers here are innervated by ulnar nerve. Now, in this case, you can, you, your index finger and middle finger are still intact because of median nerve, but again, you've lost that MCP flexion as well, and then that DIP flexion as well, so you've lost both of those. So you're not able to flex those fingers in and bring them in towards your thumb. In the sensory loss, this is going to be an ulnar nerve injury, so it's going to be in the ulnar nerve distribution. So it's going to be in the medial half of the hand, so both on the palmar aspect here in the blue, and then on the dorsal aspect here in this grayish color. So now to compare these two, this is our last pair. The distal median nerve injury, sit down here at this point right here, and then a proximal ulnar nerve injury right here. So distal median nerve injury, you have loss of lumbricals 1 and 2 because it's the median nerve. Ulnar nerve injury, you're going to have loss of lumbricals 3 and 4, so that's the big difference there. Forearm flexor muscles are intact here. Now even though it's a median nerve injury, since the injury is down here, all of these muscles have already received their innervation, so they're intact. So that's a very key thing versus in a proximal ulnar nerve injury, you most of the forearm flexor muscles are intact because the median nerve in this case is intact, except for the flexor carpi ulnaris and the ulnar half of flexor digitorum profundus. So that's what's going to contribute to our presentation, so that's an important point. And then lastly, this presentation occurs essentially when you're trying to make a fist or you could say the OK sign, whatever you want to call it. So when trying to make a fist or the OK sign, again, these fingers get stuck. They can't flex in like this. Versus in the distal median nerve injury, this occurs when the fingers are trying to extend or they're at rest. So these fingers can extend just fine versus these fingers cannot extend because you don't have that contribution to extension from the lumbricals, and then you have the forearm flexor muscles, which are intact, and they're acting unopposed, pulling the fingers in this way. So again, you're trying to extend out this way, they get stuck versus here you're trying to pull everything in this way and then these fingers get stuck. All right, so that's all the peripheral nerve lesions, all the different claw hands that we wanted to talk about and compare them. So now it's officially the end of the text for chapter two. Next, we're gonna go into some brachial plexus cases. Again, like the peripheral nerve lesions, we waited till the end to make sure you had all the anatomy of you know, the arm, the forearm, the shoulder, and so, because the brachial plexus lesions can really affect the entire upper extremity, and so it's important to know the anatomy all the way down to the hand. So that's why we waited till the end to really go through those, and so we'll go through those cases next.